Now, straight into the business, creation or evolution, do we have to choose? And away we go. Now, since our time is obviously um, very short, I thought I'd make just two basic assumptions, um, which may or may not be right, but I think it'll help us to get to the heart of the matter. Um, first assumption is I'm assuming that everyone here will not want to take the early chapters of Genesis as teaching us science. And the second assumption I'm going to take is um, that people have a sort of general background of what evolutionary biology is about and you don't have any problems with it. <laughs> okay, now, those two assumptions may be totally false, but it just means we can sort of get on and look at some other things and then if you want to come back to those assumptions, of course we, uh, of course we can. But if those two assumptions are correct, then it means that everybody here in the room would want to answer no to this question, creation or evolution, uh, do we have to choose? Now, of course, once we have accepted that, when we can get down to these sort of basic, I'm sorry if you can't see the screen, um, we can get down to the, the real meat uh, of the question, which is, of course, I think, for most people doing theology, is um, the theological questions that arise from taking these two bodies of knowledge and taking them very seriously indeed. And, of course, the first question that people always raise is, what about all that suffering involved in the evolutionary process, all that death, 99% of all the species that went extinct, all that kind of thing. And then, of course, the second question is how the Genesis teaching about Adam and Eve, uh, the fall, that whole narrative, um, can really relate to the evolutionary narrative, or perhaps it doesn't relate at all. Okay, so those, I think, are the usual questions that people bring up in churches if you talk about this sort of thing, and so forth and so on. So I just thought we'd do um, a two-minute review. This is my biologist review of um, human death in the Bible. Forgive me, you know, if I, we're in a hurry. So, um, but basically, as far as I can see, the, the Bible knows three kinds of death. It knows about physical death, it knows about spiritual death, and it knows also about eternal spiritual death. And I think as you work through the passages uh, in the Old Testament, at least what strikes me is how very earthy the whole thing is, if you like, how sort of very matter-of-fact it is in some ways about death. You have your allotted time span on the earth and you die. And if you're a king, you get buried and so forth and so on. And so it goes on, you go to Sheol. And of course, Sheol is that very dominant idea in the Old Testament. I don't think sin is particularly linked to physical death per se. You can come back at me if you, if you like on that one. Um, but in the Old Testament, it seems to be linked to, to early death, to unfortunate death, um, death as punishment, death as animal sacrifice, and so forth. Very clearly, uh, death is God's decision. Lots of passages on that in the Old Testament. Now, of course, when we come to the, the New Testament, I always think it's a bit like um, the difference between walking in a wood, you know, with a shadowy moonlight, the sort of the Old Testament shield, this very shadowy place, and then suddenly you come to a very stark contrast between life and death in the New Testament. It's as if you now come in the same wood in sunlight, everything is much more contrasted. And there, of course, death looks much more like an enemy to be overcome. Jesus raises the dead. Jesus weeps at the tomb of Lazarus. Um, and we go on to Paul, where, of course, death is uh, a sting that uh, Christ has re re uh, released us from. Jesus has come to free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. So death involves fear. Now, contrast, so that's physical death. Spiritual death, then, number two, um, an idea, I guess, that appears in the Old Testament in embryonic form and then is absolutely rampant throughout the, uh, throughout the New Testament. Paul's whole exposition of sin and the law in Romans, of course, separate uh, centers are all around spiritual death and so forth. All those passages I don't even have to go through here. And then we have the third type of death, which I guess we can call the second death, um, that phrase used uh, four times in the book of Revelation, this eternal separation from God, which Jesus speaks of in Matthew 10, 28. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. And then that whole theme followed up in the book of Revelation until finally that second death itself is sort of thrown into the lake of fire, which is the second death. So that's death um, in the Bible in a very brief abstract. So physical death temporary, not to be feared by believers, spiritual death separation from God, put right by repentance and faith of God, leading to the assurance of salvation and resurrection to the eternal life. Only death to be really scared of, as far as I can see in the New Testament, is, is the second death. We should be 
uh, afraid of that. People should be afraid of that. But of course, Christ free, frees us from that fear. Now, okay, so what about death then in evolutionary biology? I think what we see when we go to the biological side of the equation is the extent to which um, death is all linked with life, the two go together, and the way in which biology is really a package deal. Once you have carbon-based life on this planet, and I suspect that's the kind of life that we'll find in other planets when we finally do find life somewhere, but this is the carbon, the phosphorus, the nitrogen, the oxygen, the elements made in the dying moment of exploding stars of which all our bodies composed we all stardust. And once you have that carbon-based life, then all kinds of things follow from that. And you can actually generate this sort of table. On one side, you put all, if you like, the positive things. You know, we have life, we can have food, uh, and so forth. Uh, actually, mutations, of course, are essential for our existence. We would all look the same without those mutations and so forth. And then on the other side, we can put a kind of minus uh, list, if you like. Um, across every point, any point you want. Survival, well, you need pain. Mutations essential for existence. Mutations, of course, cause cancer and so forth. So you can construct this huge table. You can put hundreds of things on both sides. So this is what I mean by saying that life, carbon-based life, is a package deal. You can't really have one side of the table without the other. And of course, carbon-based life is impossible Without death, uh, there are no multicellular animals that can drive all the energy needs uh, simply by photosynthesizing, staring at the sun. It would be interesting if we could genetically engineer ourselves to do that, although I'm not sure we would live very long in Toronto at the moment, certainly not in England. But uh, I think we sometimes forget the huge, massive scale of death upon this, uh, upon this planet, the way that everything is linked to everything else in these great food chains. As you probably know, we have um, tenfold more bacteria in our bodies than we do have our own cells. That's a good thought to have just after lunch. Um, but that's absolutely nothing when you compare it to just the huge mass of bacteria in the world. It's estimated that somewhere around 5 times 10 to the 30 bacteria in the world, most of them underground. So if you take them all, uh, their general, the, the, the whole mass is sort of equivalent to all the plants in the whole world. An incredible amount of death going on if you think of how often bacteria die as well. So a huge amount of death going on in the biological world. We can think of the 99% of the species um, that have gone extinct. We can think of the huge amount of human death. I don't know if you ever think about that. Roughly 155,000 people die every day in the world. That's around 108 every minute since we've been sitting here. We can do the maths. Uh, if you, I'm sorry about this statistic, but you know people like to visualize things. If you put all the people who died in a dead bodies, you pile them up in the sky, you would get a pile of about 30 miles high every day. Okay. I mean, it just so helps to focus the mind, isn't it? I think it's good to focus our minds. You know, there's a, a lot of death going on in the world, as, long as, as well as a lot of life. So we're living in this very dynamic world. A huge amount of coming, a huge amount of going. We're on this great sort of escalator, and, uh, which is moving on, and everyone's on that escalator. And the dead are constantly making room for the living. Without that, of course, there would be no space on this planet. Uh, again very soon. Pain is an essential property of uh, biological life. Every organism, of course, has its way of um, recognizing and responding to its environment. And feeling pain is this inevitable consequence of sentience. And it appears that as uh, brain complexity and awareness of the environment increases, so pain increases with that as well. As uh, Hans Rolston remarks, the evolutionary process could be titled perversely the evolution of suffering. And yet, clearly, pain for us is essential for our survival. If we didn't have pain, we would be walking around with broken legs and munching on broken glass and all kinds of other things which we would simply ignore. And we've already said that mutations are essential for our biological diversity. If we we all vary in this room by about one every nucleotide base in our genomes. The genetic alphabet, one out of a thousand um, genetic uh, letters of the alphabet and so forth. That's what gives us our, our diversity. And of course, without that diversity, there would, wouldn't be any evolution. We wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be talking about this whole sort of question. We would be actually clonal, of course, if we had identical genomes. But at the same time, as we were thinking, 